to see everyone that's managed out. Thanks for coming. Um, if you have your Bibles, we are going to have a look again at uh, Revelation, but maybe a couple of verses uh, first of all. If you want to turn with me or just listen, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I'm going to turn first of all to Genesis, so the very beginning of your Bible. Where, uh, <coughs> suppose I'm a person of extremes. It's either the first or the last, isn't it? Nothing in between. So uh, we'll go to Genesis. And uh, Genesis chapter number 49, which if I could just remind you, is the deathbed scene of Jacob. And you might remember that uh, Jacob uh, managed to have 12 boys. Now, I don't know how he quite managed that. Uh, some of us might struggle with four or even five, but he had 12 and you can imagine that sometimes things did not always go smoothly in that family. And at the end, uh, the boys are lined up before Jacob in Genesis 49, and he goes through them. Um, perhaps we might say in colloquialism, uh, he, go, he went through them like a dose of Epsom salts in many ways. Uh, he brought them down a peg or two, and uh, uh, he, well, things came up there in his deathbed scene that perhaps they would much rather have had forgotten about. Uh, but nonetheless, Jacob brings them up, warts and all. I'm just going to read just the beginning of that scene for you, just to give you a flavour of it. It goes on for quite a bit, but Genesis 49 and verse number 1 says, And Jacob called to his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken to Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity. You can imagine him standing there, can't you, uh, before his father. And uh, with every word, you see, he's getting a little taller, isn't he? And his chest is puffing out there. My, uh, this is all very good. The beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity. Uh, here's the boy that was born, in a sense, with a silver spoon in his mouth. The, the excellence of power, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So the first of his sons, Reuben, uh, son of, uh, the, behold the son is, is what that means, the first of his sons committed adultery with his stepmother. That was the kind of boy he was. He committed adultery with his stepmother. And then we go on to Simeon, verse 5. And Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. O my soul, commit not thou into their secret, to their assembly, my honour. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So Simeon and Levi, the background to that was that they wiped out, uh, almost committed what we today would call genocide. They wiped out an entire generation of people in a city. Uh, mind you, some have argued over the years that they deserved it, but uh, that's not quite the way that Jacob sees it. Uh, but they were certainly cruel, they were callous, and they brought Jacob's name into great disrespute. They were mass murderers. And then Judah, verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now everything that's said about Judah is really pretty positive, but I would remind you too that Judah was a man who committed adultery with his daughter-in-law. Okay, So you get a kind of flavour of the boys so far. The first one committed adultery with his stepmother, the next two committed mass murder, and the fourth of them committed adultery with his uh, daughter-in-law. That was the kind of character, and none of them, apart from maybe Joseph, arguably, and perhaps Benjamin at the end, were squeaky clean. They all had uh, baggage, as you say. Now, a little verse, please, too, before we get into Revelation this evening, in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 10, please, which I think has uh, got peculiar relevance uh, to the verses that we'll read together in Revelation. 
Luke chapter 10 and verse number 20. Words of the Lord Jesus. Luke 10 and 20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. For after all of the troubles, trials, difficulties, challenges, successes and glories of earth, if it doesn't matter too much, what really matters is the eternal perspective. Maybe not too important exactly uh, the path through which you, pa you travel. That may discourage you. You might fall. You might fail. But really what's important is the end. It's the goal. Uh, it is the destination. Now come with me please into Revelation and in chapter 21. We've been looking through Revelation for uh, some time now. We've got to the second last chapter uh, of this fascinating book. And uh, Revelation chapter 21 takes us um, I suspect to that place that many of us would think it ought to be a great subject in the Bible, but maybe it's not such a great subject. It's a subject of heaven. You won't read much about it until you come to the book of Revelation. And these last two chapters, well, they're absolutely full of heaven. Uh, it might not be the kind of heaven, though, that you and I uh, um, imagine. This is the heaven of God's presence. This is the heaven of God. It's not the heaven of man's imagination. It's the heaven of divine reality. Uh, so this is heaven from heaven's perspective rather than heaven from man's perspective. And it contains some surprises. And I wanted to uh, introduce you to at least one surprise here in Revelation chapter 21, uh, but maybe two or three uh, as well thrown in for good measure. So verse 1 of Revelation 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence again this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We give thanks for thy word. It's living, it's powerful. Thy word is able to speak to us in a way that man cannot speak. And we do pray, Father, that in the living word this evening that our hearts would rejoice and that we would hear the voice of heaven. How good it would be, Father, that we might have a taste of that living water for which there is that endless and eternal supply in heaven. And we pray, our Father, that some of the light of the glory of that place would even touch us here this evening. So be with us, our Father. Give us grace. We need it so much as we pray, Father, for thy help. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as I read through those opening verses in Revelation chapter 21, through this description of heaven, there's lots of questions that would come to mind and lots of things have been said about them over the years. But um, as I think about these verses and think about maybe sharing something from the Word of God, I, I kind of try and maybe do it from 
an angle that maybe others haven't done it from and maybe ask questions that others haven't asked. So that when we, we read this, we don't maybe just get facts, just cold hard facts, but we get food for our souls, something that might just help and encourage. You see, I don't want to leave heaven in heaven uh, this evening. I don't want to leave heaven up there. How wonderful it would be if this evening we might just get a little taste of it, uh, if we might just be drawn a little closer to it. Now, one of the questions that struck me as I read through Revelation chapter 21 is maybe a question at times that, that might strike you, especially in the light of what is said there at the beginning of Revelation chapter 21, as uh, the Apostle uh, John uh, describes to us the new heaven and the new earth. Did you notice he says something really very important that might just be a little discouraging if you're a negatively minded person? For he says there that uh, he saw the old heaven, the first heaven and the first earth, verse, verse 1, pass away, pass away. This old earth that you and I know, and the old heavens as well that you and I know, they are, uh, well, they are set for demolition. They have a demolition order over them. They will go. They will pass away. And that's emphasised a little later on as well, uh, in, in at the beginning of the chapter, uh, that idea of everything being made new again, and the old passing away, and it, uh, it's kind of repeated right the way through the chapter. Now here's the question that kind of struck me as I read that, as I thought about my life and my experience here and now, with all of its trials at times and troubles, not that I have had many, but uh, the struggles at times, the discouragements and disappointments, uh, everything that you go through, all of that life that's accumulated behind you over the past 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, whatever it might be, and bearing in mind that this text says all of that's going to be passed away, I can have asked the question, well, what's the point? <laughs> What's the point? If it's all going to go, if it's all going to go up in a puff of smoke, if it's all going to be demolished and pass away into the forgetfulness of the divine mind, then what is the point to life? There is that old saying, isn't there, that we can take nothing with us. Uh, they sometimes say there are no pockets in a shroud. You take nothing into the world and you will bring nothing out. And that, of course, is a paraphrase of a very biblical text. Well, I want to notice with you in Revelation chapter 21 that that common saying that you can take nothing with you isn't entirely true. In Revelation chapter 21, I want to suggest to you that there are four things, at least, that you're going to take with you into heaven. Uh, four things that connect now and then, that connect the old and the new. Four things that you have a flavour of, a taste of now, that last forever. And some of it, some of it's very encouraging, some of it might be downright scary. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse number three, that our relationship with God continues. Verse three, and I heard a great voice out of heaven, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That link with God that you have now will continue forever, although it will be changed. And that relationship will become a reality. You won't have to pray anymore to the God in heaven. And you won't have to wait for a preacher to tell you what the Bible means, that's for sure. Because you will be in living, intimate, eternal connection and fellowship with God. This isn't even just a going back to Eden, because I don't really believe that that's what the book of Revelation is about. This is beyond Eden. This is infinitely far better than Eden. This is the eternal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with his people. So if you have that living connection with God now, you'll take that with you and it will be even better. That relationship will become a reality. You will be taken, and the picture here is really, you will be transported from outside of the temple or tabernacle right into the most holy place uh, that nobody could go apart from a high priest once a year. You will be in intimate fellowship and connection with the God of heaven. Even closer, actually, I think, than Adam. Never mind, I think... Even closer than Adam, because Adam just knew about the Lord visiting Eden in the cool of the night. So if you tell, if you hear people say that the Bible is about Eden restored, you can tell them they're talking nonsense. They're talking nonsense. The Bible is about something infinitely far better than Eden. God didn't get, allow sin and the fall and all of that to happen uh, just so he could take us back to where we'd begun. Definitely not. 
God moves us from the good of Eden, uh, Genesis 1, into the glorious of Revelation chapter 22. And that might be a subject for another evening. So the first thing that we would take with us is our relationship in verse 3. Secondly, expectations. And we'll come to this in a moment. The expectations of earth will continue, but into experience. In verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their, their eyes. The things that you expect. The things that your heart longed for, anticipated, eternally desired, will be fulfilled in heaven. We'll come to that in a minute. Fourthly, that that taste that you have uh, of that living water now, uh, verse number six, and he said to me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of living water freely. You're going to do uh, what David Livingston did. Uh, about 150 years ago, he tried to trace, I think he successfully traced, uh, the source of the Zambezi. He was very interested in the Zambezi River. I think it's the second longest river in Africa. You can make correct me if not. He was interested in tracing the source of the Zambezi. He could see it trickling out or pouring out really as a, as a torrent uh, out into the ocean. And so he traced it right the way back uh, into inland Africa through Zimbabwe, up through the Muziatuni, the Victoria Falls, and, and up there into Zimbabwe, up through Zambia, uh, right to the uh, corner there. Uh, of uh, up by uh, past uh, uh, what's anyway, uh, right at the corner, a uh, northwest province of, of Zambia. He traced it. You see, he, he had a little taste, a little vision of that river. He wanted the source of it, though. He wanted the source of it, and he found the source of it. And the believer that has tasted of that water now will find the source of it in heaven. Isn't that great? Find the source of it. Uh, uh, verse number six I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the river. The fountain of it, the fountain of it. Oh, just a trickle, you know. I don't know if you, uh, uh, like ourselves, last night about half past uh, 10, 11 o'clock, um, you turned on the tap to get water. I don't know if you got a trickle. We got a trickle. <laughs> uh, they were repairing the mains and the pressure dropped and uh, there was uh, little water, just enough to brush your teeth. Uh, we were all a bit panicky in case there would be no showers in the morning. Uh, that would be a bit off-putting if, if I went to work, but uh, uh, but it came back on, just a trickle. But that's all we get really on earth, you know, of the divine. You just get a trickle, a little taste here and there, don't you? But we're going to trace it back to the source, and the source here is in heaven. And here it's not a trickle you're going to get, it's a fountain of living water, uh, that water of life freely. Uh, so three things, a relationship, an expectation, a taste, and fourthly, verse 12. I'm going to suggest we might not get to it tonight, but character that continues. Uh, character that continues from earth to heaven. Character that is formed upon earth. So let's think a little bit about that, shall we, uh, this evening. We'll see how far we get. Verse number three, that which continues relationship. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle. Let me remind you that the tabernacle was a tent in the Old Testament. It was a portable or a mobile temple. It, it really consisted of three different compartments. And the inner part was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, the Holy of Holies. That eventually became a temple, uh, but uh, the tabernacle was mobile. And it was a place where God would, in fact, put his name. You've got a text, of course, over in the book of Exodus as God commands his people to build such a place. Uh, that he might dwell amongst them, build a sanctuary, that I might dwell amongst you. And so it was the place where God met with his people, precious place. You see, this world that you and I in, are, are in is a, a lonely and a dangerous place. It has been a lonely, empty, dangerous place since Genesis chapter 3 and 4, since uh, Adam and Eve were put out of Eden. And they're put out of Eden with the guard on the, on the door into Eden with the end angelic cherubim, keeping them out of Eden. They were cast into a world, a world where those creatures that Adam had dominion over became the predators of Adam. Dangerous place. A place where even the soil that he would till rejected his toil. It was a place where his efforts came at times to fruitlessness because of the curse upon the ground that God had made. 
It was a place where he was separate from the God that created him. It was a, a place that was empty, it was barren, it was a place that was frightening and fearful. It was a place where, in fact, even when you looked at the tiniest part of that creation, if you were to focus down to its very smallest point, it didn't become less dangerous, it became infinitely more dangerous, even in the microbiology of that world, full of viruses and disease and plague and uh, all sorts of, 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 of things that have just come to pass in recent days, COVID and all of these things. This world was a dangerous place, a lonely place, a fearful place. And perhaps there is an echo in the soul of every single human being that comes from that time. A time when man felt alone, uh, abandoned, and a hunger that's in our soul just to reconnect. At, at times we don't even know what it is that we need, but we know we need something because we've been left empty, cast out of Eden and cast out of fellowship from God. And I think we see the confusion of the world round about us today as a reflection of that. People thinking they need something, and thinking it might be found in an identity or some major surgical procedure that would change their sexuality. That's what we need. We've got an emptiness. We need that. They don't. They don't need that. Or, or maybe we think we'll find it in drugs or, or the pursuit of something like that. That's not what you need. It might dumb the pain or numb the pain, but it's not what you need. And what we need, of course, is that link, that living relationship with God, a relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ made possible through the blood of his cross, a relationship that he, he, he established by the cross work, by the shed blood, the one who knew no sin, who became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that cross connecting literally heaven and earth is the way back for you and I into a living relationship with God. <coughs> well... In verse 3, heaven is a place where that relationship, if we have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, and we have had a taste of that relationship, the fullness of it is here in heaven. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with me. Secondly, it is a place where expectation becomes experience. Verse 4, I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, that maybe would help to illustrate how I understand these verses. Every so often in my line of work, I um, get uh, a patient who teaches me a thing or two. <laughs> um, there, there was a medical journal that I used to read some time ago, and they used to have a page in it. And uh, doctors would write in, uh, about uh, patients who taught them a lesson. And uh, we all have them. I remember a lady who came to see me some time ago and she had been put on medication uh, for anxiety and depression. And she came in with a very unusual request and I've never forgotten her request. She said, I'd like you to stop the tablets because I want to cry. And that puzzled me. I want you to stop the tablets because I want to cry. And of course my thought, maybe your thought too, would be, well, is that not why we prescribe the medication to stop you from crying? But what she meant was maybe not exactly what she said. What she meant was this. That while she could not cry, that is shed tears, that inner pain and emptiness was still there. That sense of loss was still there. That bereavement and that, that turmoil in her soul that came from all of the trials and problems that she had endured over the years, that was still there. And she could feel it inside. And nothing that I could give her would take that away. But what she had found was that whilst all of that inner turmoil, those tears and that strain was still there, she could not shed a tear. All we had managed to do was block the expression of that grief. Now, I want you to notice that heaven is a lot better than that. A lot better than that. That here in heaven, these expectations that I trust that you and I have, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, will be fulfilled. Expectations become experience. Verse 4, look at how God, look at how the Lord Jesus Christ wipes away tears. Verse 4, 
and God shall wipe away all tears. <coughs> all tears. Before we read the rest of it, let me take you back to John 11. Let me take you back to John 11. I want to take you, just by way of illustration of what this means, uh, to one of the very few occasions in which the Lord Jesus Christ encountered death. There's maybe more to that story, but one of the few occasions is in John 11. And uh, the Lord Jesus encounters people who are grieving. Mary and Martha, two sisters. So if, if you're in John 11, you can look down at verse 19 with me. Otherwise, just I'll read it. And many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning the brother. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise. Now if you go down just a little bit, let me show you how the Lord Jesus Christ would comfort Mary and Martha. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Verse number 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Said I not to thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou wouldest see the glory of God. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, and they believe that, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, and he that was dead came forth. Have you ever tried to give comfort to someone who's lost someone? That's how the Lord Jesus Christ gives comfort to those that are bereaved. He goes to the grave and he emptied it. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> he doesn't just stop their tears. He stopped the cause of their tears. That's different, isn't it? Now, if you come to the end of the story, which is Revelation 21, and... I know that there are many of us that could take a walk not far from where we're sitting uh, this evening. And you, 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 you and I, will, well, I've got friends up there and many of you have got family in the graveyard. And you say, well, they're still there, Stuart, they are there. <clears throat> but there is this precious hope that the Lord Jesus Christ shared with Mary and Martha. That he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so that... A miracle of Lazarus isn't a one-of, it's a pattern to be followed. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now let's see how God in eternity in heaven comforts and wipes away all tears. Verse 4 of Revelation 21, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, number one, neither sorrow, number two, nor crying, number three. Neither shall there be any more pain, number four. What are we saying here? Well, four in the Bible, as we've mentioned in a previous evening, is a number that is often uh, indicative of a complete statement of something, <clears throat> a complete rounded picture of something. You know, the four points of the compass, the four quarters of the globe, the, and so forth. And so what we have is this complete picture of the way that God will wipe away all tears. And he does it by removing every cause for the tears. So nobody's going to come to God and say, can you, can, I, I want to cry. I, I want the tears back. Because the pain is still there. The loss is still there. The emptiness is still there. The anguish is still there. Because all of that will have gone. The death will have gone. And the anguish will have gone. And the pain will have gone. And the suffering will have gone. The cause for the tears will have stopped. And that's how he stops the tears. He takes away the cause for the tears. And so he takes away death. And he'll take away everything short of death. Sorrow. You could translate that suffering. And you and I know that death is one point in life at the very end. 
But leading up to that point of death, that it can be a very long time. Some, for some people, all their life can be suffering after suffering. But that suffering will be removed. And not only that, but crying or deep anguish. There are perhaps more people I have met that have a deep spiritual, emotional and mental anguish than a physical one. That too will be removed. And fourthly, pain. How often that is linked with tears that will have gone. Do you see how God deals with our tears? He doesn't just stop us from crying. That's easy. Any clown can do that. Even I can do that. That's no great boast. God does something infinitely far better. He stops the cause for it. Stops the cause for it. And he does that by the power of the Lord Jesus. He does that by the cross work of the Lord Jesus. The saviour that could go to Mary and Martha and promise himself as a resurrection and a life was the one that entered into death and entered into the grave and took the suffering for my sin and took the place for, for, for my judgment and entered into the grave and he came up out of the grave victorious. And if I'm linked with him, if my faith is in a saviour that's victorious over death and the grave, then that's my prospect. What a wonderful prospect that is. So heaven is a place where we continue with our relationship with God. The expectation becomes experience and the taste of that living water takes us to that torrent that flows in verse 6. And he saith to me, it's done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give Unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. I think the hymn writer many years ago got the thought of that, didn't he? It's in the Believer's uh, Hymn Book. Uh, it's in many of the hymn books. It's 190 in the Believer's. And the uh, first verse of that says, O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love, the streams on earth I've tasted. More deep, I'll drink above. There to an ocean's fullness. He's captured that, hasn't he? Uh, there to an ocean's fullness. His mercy does expand. And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. I think the writer got that sense that we've tasted of the trickle. But really what we're looking for is a torrent. And there in Revelation 21 we have the torrent. Let me remind you that I do... I think, I do see that the Word of God teaches that the human soul is very, very thirsty for this. Uh, for not only in Eden was man in communion with God, but there was a river. Do you remember? There was a river that ran through Eden. And that uh, river split into four heads. And in Genesis 1, you'll read that that river was a river that fed Eden. So it fed that tree of life. And it ran out of Eden, having passed the tree of life, and it fed and it watered the land. And that Eden was cut off from man. And so right the way through the scriptures, there are occasions when we get a little taste of that tree, that little, a little taste of that river of life. It came flowing out of the rock in the wilderness as Moses took his rod and struck the rock. And they got a taste of water. Not, not just ordinary everyday water, but water of divine supply. And that woman at the well in John 4, she got a taste of it, didn't she? She got a taste of it. Remember that, John 4? If you have your Bible, let me flick back. Maybe I'll just show you something that I discovered the other day. John chapter 4. Remember, she comes just for ordinary water to the well. Verse 13 of John 4. Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. The ordinary water in the well. Yeah, you need it. Satisfy your thirst, but you'll need to come back all the time. That's just ordinary water. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. <laughs> she got a taste of it there. Read the whole story. But the source of it was the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> the source of it here is, as we see it in heaven, we get the everlasting flow. And that... That, that water, that living water, I trust you've tasted of it in faith in the Lord Jesus. You've come to him as your saviour. You've, you've enjoyed his presence. You've opened his word. You've been refreshed by that living water from his word. Maybe you've heard the preacher share something from Christ and it's refreshed your soul. Well, that's refreshing water. It's everlasting water. And verse 15, 
It's better water than you've ever tasted. Superior water. So I read verse 15 the other night. I came across an answer to a question I was asked many years ago that I couldn't quite get a straight answer to. It was a straight enough, straightforward enough question, but I was kind of stumped as to give an answer to it. <laughs> Maybe you're, you're sharper than me and you'll have a better answer than me, but I was asked this question. Can a backslider, that is a person who's a Christian, can a backslider ever be truly happy back in the world? Now, the obvious answer is no. That is the obvious answer. But I kind of struggled to find a verse for that. I couldn't just think of a clear verse off the top of my head. A Christian who perhaps has gone back into the world, maybe not doing anything grossly <laughs> wicked, just filling their lives with ordinary things, you know. Maybe a hobby here or there, and maybe a wee holiday here or there, that kind of stuff. Just nothing, nothing bad, bad, but just not really filling their hearts with Christ. Can they be happy with that? Ask the woman at the well. Do you notice what she says? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. So we're going to drink of the living water that comes from the Lord Jesus. She's going to come and rest her soul in the Saviour. A Saviour that would die for her at the cross, pay the price for her sins, and give her that gift of eternal life and supply her soul with living water. Sir, give me that water that I thirst not. Have you, have you tasted of that? But look what else she says. Neither come thither to draw. In other words, now that I've got the best, well, just ignore the rest. It doesn't matter about the rest. It's never going to do for me what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me. Once I've grasped the living water and been utterly satisfied and refreshed uh, by that living water, then I'm not really bothered with the old stuff. It's just, it's just rubbish. Because I've got the best. You see? So what's the answer to that question? Can a genuine Christian who backslides ever be truly happy in the world? No. There's lots of verses maybe you can think of. But I think that's a really good one. <laughs> now that I've got the Lord Jesus Christ, the rest is just rubbish. It's never going to satisfy me because I've found real satisfaction. And do you know what? She's as good as her word. Uh, because if you go, you, you remember that she, she came there uh, to draw water. And see if you were just to go down a, a wee verse or two, uh, you would find there that uh, she heads off uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number 28, and the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. It's not Mr. Christ. <laughs> what are you leaving your water pot for? You, got, you needed the, that for the water, did you not? Just find something better. Never mind the water pot. Ditch the water pot. We've found the source. <laughs> Somebody just put in the plumbing. Eh? We don't need to go drawing from the well. There was there's a well in the garden next to us, and uh, up where we stay. It seems to be a, one of these holes that they could never quite fill up. I would suspect it's been the well from the old castle. We don't use it anymore. Somebody plumbed us into the mains. <laughs> it's far better, isn't it? She's been plumbed into the mains. Doesn't need a bucket anymore. And you see, the prospect of the Christian is that that taste of living water in Revelation chapter 21 will be utterly supplied by that torrent. That fountain of water of life that flows forever. So three things uh, that we take with us to heaven, a relationship that becomes reality. <clears throat> the expectation uh, of comfort, verse 4, that becomes eternal experience. That taste that you've tasted now becomes that torrent, that supply. And fourthly, and perhaps most surprisingly, your character. Verse 12 of Revelation 21. And it had a wall great and high, 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. I think that's pretty surprising. <laughs> pretty surprising. Uh, if it's surprising for me, I think it will be utterly shocking for Jacob. Because Jacob went through those boys in uh, Genesis 49 and uh, he tore a strip off a good number of them. We read some of them. And all of those boys, well, they all had different characters. Some of them 
had the character of kingship, like Judah, for example. That was his experience later on, anyway. He was a king. Some of them had a kind of priestly character, like Levi. Others had had a hard time in life, like Joseph. And in Genesis 49, you read about that. The archers were there shooting at him. A picture of what was about to happen to him as his uh, brothers would sell him, or had just happened to him. Uh, the brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. Do you remember that? And uh, he had a difficult, difficult time there. And then there were also sons that had maybe more ordinary characters. Uh, Isaacer, if I was to ask you to tell me about Isaacer, could you tell me much about him? Probably not. Uh, he's not mentioned much in the Bible specifically, but he's a servant. He's a bearer of burdens in Genesis 49, and he's one of these perhaps unseen and unsung heroes of the Bible. He just bears the burden. There it is to carry, and he carries it. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. He does it. Nobody really sees what he does, and maybe no, nobody gives him much thanks for it, but he does it. And there he is. And maybe men like Asher. Do you know much about him? Probably not. Not much is said about him, but he just uh, made royal dainties. Uh, he did things for other people, <laughs> kind things, good things. He helped, he was a help. You'll find that in the list of gifts later on in First Corinthians. So here's all these individuals, you see, and their names. Names are being used uh, to name the gates of heaven. That, I suspect, was an utter shock to Jacob. After all of the trials and turmoil and turbulence that he'd had with those boys, all of the ups and downs and the disappointments, all of the times when he was plunged into deep despair as uh, Simeon and Levi went and slaughtered a whole city full of men. Shame came upon him, utterly devastated. Times when he discovered that his wife had committed adultery with one of his sons. Utter shame and devastation. On that occasion when he, he suspected within his heart that when they brought back that coat of many colours stained with bloods, that maybe that blood was not Joseph's blood. There was something different about that coat. Either they had murdered him or something, something just terrible had happened. And he anticipated going to the grave with that grief over him. And yet, you know, God isn't in it for the short haul. The Christian life, you see, the Christian life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. God's in it for the end. God's in it for the eternal. And outplaying right the way through the pages of Scripture is that eternal uh, purpose and eternal vision of glory. And as we get a glimpse of heaven, do we see that, first of all, perhaps there is a sense in which the ups and downs of life make sense in the light of the eternal? That perhaps focusing on the here and now with all of the storms and the trials and the problems isn't really the point. We need to lift our eyes to glory and see where God's taking us. I know that path that you lead you on will, will be times where there will be ups and downs and disappointments and discouragement. But wouldn't it be great if ultimately what we saw were, were names written in heaven and there's Jacob's boys. With all of the problems that Jacob has seen, those names become the names of the gates of heaven. How wonderful. And perhaps there is this second thought that's linked with those names there in heaven. And it's that of character. Twelve boys. Twelve absolutely different characters. I don't know which gate you would choose to go through. I'm assuming that you have trusted and you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus so that you might be there. But I wonder... Which gate you might go through, was my simple thought. Maybe kingly, would that be your experience of earth? You see, I would go through Judah's gate. <laughs> Were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth? Simeon, uh, the firstborn, would that be yours? Or maybe you were the underdog in life, Benjamin. You started off bad. started off with a bit of a noose around your neck. Do you know, they didn't call him Benjamin at birth. They called him Benoni, son of sorrow. That was a bit of a name to be stuck with, wasn't it? <laughs> Grief from the very beginning. His father changed it though, son of my right hand. Your father can change that too. You might have started off with disappointment and grief and sorrow, but your father can change that. 
Or maybe you're one of those silent uh, servants, like Isaac had. Nobody really noticed you, but you're doing a work for the Lord. He noticed. So what everybody else thought didn't really matter. <laughs> he noticed. And he rewards. You see, maybe Isaac is the gate that I'll go through. I remember as a younger person many years ago in uh, a little church in Kitmere Hill, many, well, yeah, many years ago, and um, I had an uncle, Davy, and my uncle, Davy, was an Isaacer. And I always thought, well, if I have to do anything in the church, I'll do, be like my uncle, Davy. He never got up on the platform, he never spoke. Uh, that terrified me. I thought, the one thing I'll never do is get up and preach, that's for sure. <laughs> terrified the wits out of me. I'll be an uncle, Davy. I'll count the money at the end of the Sunday morning and uh, I'll put out the bread and I'll do the hoovering and uh, that kind of thing. I'm quite happy to do that and look after the hall. He was one of these silent people in the background. You never really noticed. It just all kept going because he did it. <laughs> and then one day he wasn't there and it didn't get done because he'd done all these things. He was a great man in many ways, you see. Well, you could choose your gate, but here's the point. The character that we have that is formed in us, the character that's moulded and shaped in us by the hand of God through our lives, the character that's formed by the trials and afflictions, the tests and the disappointments, by the, by the, the, the joys as well. Those times when God has shaped us and moulded us and changed us by his word, 2 Corinthians 3, and by the trials and afflictions of life, 2 Corinthians 4. Those experiences you've passed through that has made you the believer that you are today. Those edges he's knocked off you. Those times when you've been utterly devastated and discouraged and the only place you could flee was to him and you found the living water satisfied and you learnt a lesson in that. Or you were sinking deep in the water and all you could do is cry, Lord, save me, and his hand went out and it grabbed you and pulled you up. And by my, did you learn a great lesson from that. And all of those experiences of life have changed and moulded a character in you. Ecclesiastes gives me a promise that that which God does, he does forever. And if God's done it in you, he's done it forever. The character that is formed in you that reflects something of the glory of his son lasts and endures forever. Choose your gate. <laughs> and maybe your gate will be different from mine. Mine's probably won't be Judah. <laughs> Nothing much kingly about me. Maybe, maybe Asher. Yes, maybe. Maybe an Isaac or just getting on with the work that's there. I don't know. Eh? Uh, choose your gate. But the character that God forms in you lasts forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we come into thy presence with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the word of God. It's a wonderful uh, revelation that has been given to us. We give thanks as the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It comes from him. And how wonderful, our Father, to see that the revelation of the word of God that comes from Christ, that's all about Christ, leads us to Christ. We thank thee, our Father, for that little taste, that trickle at times of water, of refreshing that we have. Oh, we could have far much more, we know, but at times, if we're honest, we have a trickle. We thank thee, our Father, that there is that gushing source of living water, that fountain there in heaven. We give thanks, our Father, that that joy of the presence that we have known, that has touched our hearts and lives now, that there is that eternal dwelling with God. How <coughs> infinitely wonderful that is. That that expectation we always had of tears wiped away will be fulfilled. And now we thank thee, our Father, for hope that is given to us. That the trials, tests, difficulties, challenges, disappointments, and encouragements and joys of life, that they have purpose and meaning. That the character of Christ is formed in us, that lasts. It endures forever. How we thank thee, our Father, that that which God does, 